Hello, and welcome to the last talk of Wednesday here at Black Hat. Uh, you're in the Jasmine room today, and you're here to see, hopefully, the Node.js Highway by Amit Ashbel and Mati Simon. Um, there are a couple of quick announcements. There's a reception tonight, right now, in the business hall, but you're here, which is probably a much better choice. Then at 6.30, the Pony Awards happen in the Mandalay BCD room. I know earlier a couple of times we said 6 o'clock, it's actually 6.30. And if you have cell phones, make sure that the, uh, they're on a vibrate mode or some kind of a silent mode so you don't have crazy ringtones interrupting the talk. That's it. Uh, thank you and enjoy. Good, ev good evening, everyone. Uh, I, as, I, as we were presented, I am Mati Siman, and together with me is Amit Ashbel. Uh, during the last year, we did some research regarding Node.js to add Node.js support to our product. We both work for check marks. And we found some interesting stuff regarding Node.js and we felt that many people don't know this aspect with Node.js and we thought it would be nice to share these insights or these findings with the community. So in the next 30 minutes or so we will show you some interesting stuff. Actually there were some additional issues that we wanted to show but because this is a fairly short presentation we, didn't, we won't show everything. Uh, feel free to join us at our booth to see some additional issues. Amit? Hi everyone. So as presented twice already, my name is Amit and we'll jump right uh, to it because uh, we are very limited in time. Um, in terms of the agenda, we'll quickly cover the Node.js architecture and after the architecture we'll go through some of the um, vulnerabilities or some of the uh, wrong programming techniques um, that Mati mentioned a second ago, they'll include uh, items like denial of service, some weak crypto, um, SQL injection with no SQL, and uh, uh, regex denial of service. So uh, let's uh, go ahead and talk about the architecture. So Node.js, as uh, some of you may know, is a single threaded event driven application uh, framework. The idea is that you have the event loop in the center, which you can see, and the event queue, which constantly delivers content to the event loop to handle. Now the event loop won't handle most of the content itself. It will pass it on to the, um, to the event, uh, to the, to, to the IO um, section in the uh, process which will then go ahead and perform the actions and pass it back, any callback that's left over will pass back to the event queue so that in this case what happens actually is the event loop is constantly available to perform tasks in a quick manner. If we look at it in a more human readable <laughs> way, you have the, uh, the single thread at the cash register at the fast food restaurant and you have the event handler. Now the queue, which we can't see here, is constantly handing over actions for the single thread and that single thread is passing these actions on to the events handler. Okay? That way the single thread, the guy at the register, is constantly available to take more and more um, orders and there's no need for multiple um, actions because he has these handlers doing the work for him. Now what's good and bad about that? There's a lot of advantages for Node.js. Um, the fact that it's uh, very quick with I.O. Um, it's good with DB queries. Um, we'll see that in a second. And um, it's good for, for applications that have high user interactions, so web applications mainly. However, when we move over to CPU intensive applications, it's less of a recommended uh, method to use because in that case you'd actually be um, uh, making the event loop working too hard and it won't be available to go on and, and, and uh, perform other actions with the um, event handlers. So uh, denial of service. What we see on the screen here is a few lines of code that what it does actually is sum up a number between 1 and P, where P can be any number that you choose. Um, and we want to see why this is actually related to denial of service. And this is actually our first demo. 
So you have two screens here. Each one of them is going to run that script that we just saw. So in this case you have uh, the number 5, P equals 5, so it's going to sum 1 through 5. Okay? And if I click that... They don't see it on their screen. Yes, they do. You, do you see it? No, it's cut. The left hand side is cut. Oh. Just okay, let me put it on full screen. Better? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still cut. Okay. So, now this is actually running through an event, uh, Node.js uh, framework or Node.js code. Um, and if, once I click the five, it automatically does the action, calculates one through five, and it gets in a number 15. Very simple. Then I go to a higher number, so in this case it's one with a lot of zeros, and I'll add in another zero just to make sure, and it's going to require more CPU um, activity, and therefore it's going to take more time. At the same time, I'm going to run the five again, and we'll see if I get it fast enough. that it's going to wait until this one completes. So you see that the one with the large number is still running and the five which previously took a second to complete is not completing yet until the other one completes. So let's give it a second and you'll see that it happens one after the other in a second once it happens. I think you added an extra zero. I think I added too many zeros. <laughs> Okay, it's running in the background. The idea here is that it's currently not being able to process anything else. If we look at the uh, task manager, we'll see that the thread is currently using 25% of the CPU, which is a full uh, core out of the quad cores that this uh, laptop runs. So once it finishes, and we probably won't have a chance to see it finishing, the other one will immediately be uh, processed and completed within a second. So that's a problem. You can actually, and I think, I've denied myself of service at the moment. Um, but the idea is that if you run a high CPU intensive application, um, Node.js is not the right way to go. And with that, I'll pass it over to Mati. Thank you. Thanks, Amit, for breaking the laptop just before my part of the presentation. <laughs> it's a great idea. So we'll get back to denial of service later on when we describe the regular expression denial of service, but it, it was important to describe the architecture behind Node.js and um, allocate all CPU. The next part will describe a little bit about weak cryptography. So uh, as part of the research, we went through some open source projects and one piece of code that actually caught our eyes was this code in here. It was part of a system that authenticates user and something that competes with OAuth allows you to integrate multiple services into same um, authentication mechanism. Obviously I, we hid some of the information but does, can anyone tell us what's wrong with that code in here? Uh, the MD5? The MD5 is one of the problems, yeah. Math yeah, math random, exactly. So uh, basically the idea is uh, it, when a new user registers, the system generates a new random or pseudo random number and then generates the MD5 of that number and returns it back as the, as the user's password. So there are two issues in here. The first one is that math random is not really random. That's pseudo random obviously. And it's fairly weak and we'll see that. The other part is that MD5, um, although it is a strong or fairly strong hashing algorithm, it can be reversed fairly easily. So we'll see how we actually break that specific code. Okay, so let's talk a little bit how the set the random number generator works uh, for V8. Okay, V8 is the engine that be runs behind Chrome and, and also behind Node.js. That's the very same uh, engine. Uh, so basically we start with the seed number, okay? The seed uh, is usually based on the timer when the system started, so that's usually based on the time. And then from the, the seed uh, we, we get the state zero, which is a private value, uh, a very secret value, uh, internal value to the random generator algorithm. 
And from state zero, we actually uh, derive two numbers. Part of it is the random that is presented to the user or is given back to the developer. And then we also, also uh, derive the next state, in that case state one value. So we have the seed, we have state zero, and then we roll it to state one, state two, state three, and each one of them we can derive its uh, random number. Uh, now this is a one way algorithm, so given random zero, we can't compute back state zero. Uh, why is that? What would happen if we were able to compute back state zero from random zero? Okay, so once we are, ha once a hacker has access to state zero, he can compute all subsequent states and all future random numbers. Okay, that's why these states are very um, secret. Um, this was discovered by Amit Klein um, a few years ago. Um, Google, which runs V8, actually modifies the algorithm every so often. Uh, there are some magic numbers behind the scenes. Um, we w I won't present it right now, but they change it uh, in every few versions. Um, so basically, if we take a look back at the code, we need to do um, three things. First of all, V8, uh, based on Amit Klein's research, given three random new passwords, if we know what were the random values, we can compute all future ones. So first we need to reverse the MD5 of, of three passwords. Given the MD5, we need to compute back what was the random number uh, as the root. And then given three such numbers, we can compute all subsequent values and compute all next, uh, all next passwords. Okay, uh, there are many um, cases where this can be helpful. For example, let's say that we have a system and the user, a user clicks on forgot password and the system generates a new password for him. So as a hacker, I can uh, do f three times for I forgot my password. I will get three valid new passwords and then I can hit forgot password on behalf of, of a different user just by providing the other, other user's mail. And even without having access to the mail, we can tell what would be the, what is the newly random number. Okay, um, in that, in our demo, we will do something a bit different. So given three consecutive number uh, uh, random values, we can compute state zero and state one. Google knows about that, uh, but it is considered as uh, low risk. The reason it is considered low risk is because in Chrome and other browsers, each tab uh, has its own state. So state zero in one, of the brow in one of the tabs is different than state one or state zero in other tabs. So if, even if a, a specific website is able to, to know what's its own state zero, it means nothing for other, browse, other tabs in the same browser. That being said, while using V8 as part of Node.js, it means that all users that are using the same a Node.js server actually share the very same state zero. So one user can compute its own state zero and it will uh, hold true also for other users. Let's see how it works. So our user will register as fake user one, okay? And it gets back as a result the fake user one password. And then he will register as fake user two and will get fake user two password. Register as fake user three and get, get fake user three password. Okay, as a reminder, you can see here the, the code, okay? Then we will send all three passwords which are MD5 hashed to our rainbow table, okay? We, we've created the rainbow table specifically for that, for these uh, random numbers, okay? So we will send it to a cloud service which uh, computes back the MD5. What we'll get back as a result are the clean clean random numbers, okay? So we get back the clear random of all three passwords. And then we will send this to uh, some magic, once again on the cloud that computes the state zero out of three consecutive numbers. We'll compute the fourth number, then we create the hash code of it and we'll know what would be the password of the fourth, of the fourth user. Make sense? Perfect. So let's, let's see how it works. Um, <clears throat> Okay, now I know that the screens are a bit cut because of resolution, so let's try to do the best out of that. Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess you're laughing because of that, yeah? <laughs> 
Fair enough. So let's register as the first user, okay? User one and an email, whatever you want. Let's register. Oh, internet connectivity. No good. Just a second. I mean, can I have your laptop, please? You want to ruin mine now? Yeah, I owe you one. Okay, so good that we had a backup laptop. Okay, so let's user one, user one, let's register, let's register. Let me just zoom out a bit. And we got the first user's password, that's the MD5 of the password. Now we will run it against a rainbow boot table on the cloud, okay? That's a, a, a fairly large rainbow table. It's about 200 gigabyte large. Okay? And what we got is the plain value that actually, the, M, the reverse of this M MD5. Let's put it in here. Okay, that's the first PRNG. Let's register as user two. And we got the, the second password. Get it back to here. Let's reverse it. Okay. And now, now let's take the third password. Reverse it. Okay, so far we have the three clean values that were used to compute the password, and now uh, I will run the algorithm that actually computes the next so called random number. So let's run it. While this is running, oh, it was quick. It's good. I think, I hope it was okay. Okay, so the system tells us that the next password that should be run, should be random, is the one that begins with E2 and ends with FCC, okay? So that's what the system believes will be the next password. So now let's register it as, register as a real user. And, fair enough, E2 and FCC, okay? Uh, so the reason that we had to create a rainbow table is that all uh, publicly available rainbow tables are ones that are used to uh, decrypt passwords. So they're usually limited to eight to 10 uh, alphanumeric characters. Uh, and okay, eight to 10, uh, I'm sorry, eight to 10 numeric characters. Now the actual number that is generated by random is much longer, is usually 16 digits long. Uh, in that case, no publicly available rainbow table. Uh, I, we, we couldn't find any any rainbow table, so we had to create our own. Getting back to the presentation, actually, I'll switch back laptops for a second. <coughs> a, a little bit about. Um, SQL injection, OSQL, MongoDB. So MongoDB, for those of you who are not, don't know it so well, it's a document oriented database. So every, every, there are no records, but rather documents. And then there are no tables, but there are collections. Okay. Uh, so for example, at the very same collection table called products, we can add one record, one document, where uh, the value item is card and the value of quantity is 15. And then in the very same uh, um, collection, have another 
document with the name elephant and size uh, 1700. In order to find values in, the, in these collection, we can use product find, which finds everything, or we can issue a, a filtering using JSON format. For example, we can limit to all the ones that their quantity is 15, or we can use sub expression, and that's, cr that's crucial. Uh, we can limit to quantity that uh, is greater than 25, okay? So everything is JSON based. The filtering is JSON based, and the parameter for the, for the filtering is also JSON based. Now we know JS, uh, there is a one to one correlation between JSON structure and objects. So every object is automati automatically translated into JSON and back and forth. So we could have done the same by using var object, object.quantity equals to 15 or 25, and then do db products find object. Okay? So it's important to note for, for this slide that uh, filtering JSON, filtering MongoDB requests or queries is based on JSON, and you can do it either by sending the JSON itself or an object with the relevant values. <laughs> Let's see how it, it gets really interesting. So uh, that's obviously a SQL injection. Most of you, or hopefully all of you know that, so that's, uh, that's fairly easy. Uh, in MongoDB, uh, since it's, there is no SQL, so there is no SQL injection, as Amit said. So let's say that we get, uh, we create a, an object called name, that its value is taken directly from the query string, and then an object called password, directly taken from the password, and then we do db users find, and then we find places where username equals to na is name, and the password equals to password, and then we do some if exists. Do you think it's a good solution? Obviously the answer is no, otherwise we won't be here, but why is it? <laughs> okay, so the fun part is that although in most cases name is actually a string, we saw earlier that we can actually use a sub JSON expression. So if the name was actually a more complex object with, with data members, uh, it would have been automatically expanded in here and we could have used uh, some other operators rather than just equal. And let's see how it is done. For example, we can use db find username is greater than a and then use password greater than A. So without knowing any valid username and password, assuming that the username is greater than A, and then the password is greater than A, we would be able to log into the system, okay? So uh, uh, as a reference, you can see the full blog at Web Security's uh, site. So let's see how it works. <clears throat> so let's start with some. That's weird. Let me disconnect. Otherwise, I'll use Amit laptops again. It worked. Okay. So, um, let me zoom in a bit. Okay. So, uh, if we try to log in as admin, admin, I think we're. Welcome back, admin. That's fine. If we make a mistake, A, B, C, D, E, F. Okay, doesn't work. In order to make it well simpler for, for this presentation, uh, instead of post, we will be using the get, but it's actually the same. Okay, so we can use admin, admin in here, and if we make a mistake, that's bad. And as promised, we can use dollar GT greater than a, and then dollar GT in here. And it automatically creates a, 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 a Node.js complex object and then serialize it when it's sent to the MongoDB and welcome back admin. Okay, so without you using any valid username and password, we're able to log in. And actually, I actually can enumerate all users, so I can use here B and I see a different user. Okay, so we can just go through the system and do that. Okay? Thank you. Thanks. 
one way to to uh, fix this issue is to use, and that's what we usually see in projects, is to use the following: we do DB users find find the u get the user object that has that specific username, and then compare the password stored in the database with the password uh, provided by the user. Okay, so we don't let the MongoDB to, to validate both username and password. We just retrieve the username from the database, and then we compare the retrieved password with whatever the user typed in. Make sense? Okay. This is a good solution. No, not so much. Why is that? S um, so we, we've used the dollar GT to compare if a value is greater than. There are about 30 different operators that can be used. One of the operators, some th one that I personally like very much, is the regex operator. Okay, it allows you to find uh, entities in the database that match a specific regular expression. Now, back to Amit's part, we know that Node.js is highly sensitive to CPU intensive tasks. Regular expression is highly, five minutes left, perfect. Or not so perfect, but okay. Um, so knowing that Node.js is very sensitive and, and regular expression is, takes a lot of CPU, and we can use both to do some kind of really interesting uh, denial of service. Like that. Just a second, let me copy it from, let me copy it from my slide deck. It's okay. I hope it's okay. Let's see it. Okay. So let me paste that into here. And let me open the CPU. Okay. Now I hit enter. And you can see that MongoDB in here takes 25% CPU. I have four cores. So a single request consumes a full core to, to work on. And it takes a few seconds. Obviously, the more A's I've been adding, the longer it would take. Uh, sending four requests would take 100% of my laptop and obviously we can very easily uh, consume all CPU cycles from the server just by sending four or eight requests. So we can do it constantly. So it will actually block completely the MongoDB uh, that works behind the scenes. Okay. Um, actually running out of time. So if there are any questions, we're there are two minutes less left, so if there are any questions, that's a great time right now. Okay, so there are some additional topics that I wanted to cover. Uh, feel free to stop by our booth tomorrow. Uh, either Amit or myself will be there and we'd be happy to, to help you. Thank you very much.